Good morning. Welcome to Aaron's public policy consultation at NANOG 66. I uh, welcome you all here uh, to, to wherever we are. Where are we? Uh, we're in San Diego, the wonderful, warm San Diego. Someplace on the end of a flight, here we are. Um, so uh, public policy consultation is a discussion of the uh, uh, Aaron Internet Number Resource Policy. We facilitate it in person. We do it online. There's remote participation. We do this at the Aaron meetings. We also do them at select events, such as NANOG. Um, the uh, most important thing to remember is that this is actually a discussion that affects the policies, meaning we're going to shape the policies that end up in the NRPM, which affect how Aaron operates, how we administer number resources. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to that end, we allow remote participation. Uh, there's a webcast going on right now, live transcript, meeting materials, the chat rooms are open. Even though you see a handful of people here, there's also remote participants, and we'll make sure that we include them in the discussion. Um, so uh, during the discussion, I'm going to have um, Aaron Hughes during the policy, recommended policies. He'll be moderating, uh, making sure that everyone can have an opportunity at the mic, state your name and affiliation. We're all used to this at these conferences, name and affiliation each time you reach the mic and comply with the rules and the courtesies in the discussion guide. Okay, so at the head table, myself, I'm the president and CEO of Aaron, Aaron Hughes, the Board of Trustees at the end, Dan Alexander, our AC Chair, and Kevin Bloomberg, our AC Vice Chair. We're going to go through uh, uh, an update of what's going on uh, in Aaron uh, in terms of transfers and assignments. We'll have a report from the Advisory Council of everything on the docket uh, we'll have an update on number policy discussions, and then we'll actually do public policy consultations where we uh, actually go through the possible policy changes that we'll be doing. Um, that's it. I want to uh, welcome everyone, and we're going to get started right on. First presentation is going to be the Aaron update, and I should be able to get it. There we go. Come on up, Leslie. This is uh, Leslie Nobile, Senior Directory of Global Registry Knowledge. Leslie used to run the RSD. She's now working directly for me, working on projects focusing on the integrity of the registry. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to give you a quick update on what we're seeing at Aaron and now that we have depleted our IPv4 resources, and I'm mostly going to focus on transfers and um, uh, NERPM 4.10, which is a reserved slash 10 for IPv6 transition. So what are we seeing in a post-depletion, IPv4 depletion world? Um, well, we're seeing that the need for IPv4 is still great. We, we get questions, we get um, requests continually. Um, but what we're hearing now, which is sort of new, is that people, more and more people are seeking IPv4 space in the transfer market. They're basically saying it's inevitable. They have no choice but to do that. So they're asking lots of questions and, um, and going to the market. And because of that, we're also now seeing an increase in our specified and inter-RAR transfers. And I'll talk about those in a later slide. But those are basically the market-based transfers. Um, we're seeing more attempted hijackings. Now that there's such a high dollar value on, um, on IPv4 resources, there's a lot of people that are trying to claim them in the Aaron database. So they're mostly targeting the legacy space, the space that's been sitting there since the late 80s, early 90s, space that hasn't been updated, um, the records haven't been updated in years, the space may not be routed, the domain may have expired, so they're going in and they're re-registering the, these domains. And they're also looking for companies that per perhaps dissolved and they're re-registering the exact same company name and then they're basically trying to claim that they are the original company. So Aaron's staff is really kind of on high alert for these kinds of things. They're very good at detecting it and, um, and sort of locking it down. But um, we're seeing a lot of that. So it keeps them very busy. And one of the things that we keep telling people is it's very important to keep resource records, POC records, organization records up to date. Even if you haven't have no you know, use for Aaron's database, I mean, you're sitting there, come in and validate your POC when you get an email from us because we send them annually. So if you validate it, it updates your record and people won't be as likely to target it. 
Um, we're starting to get more requests for slash 24s from that slash 10 I just mentioned. It is the block that's been reserved for IPv6 deployment, and I'll have a slide uh, a little bit later in the presentation. And we're getting lots and lots of questions, lots of confusion around transfers, waiting lists, pre-approvals, specified transfer listing service. People are confusing all of these things and not quite sure of the rules. So we're working on our website, trying to update the content and make it much clearer. And we're also bringing this to our Aaron on the Roads, which is our on-the-road training um, sessions that we do, and trying to give more details about how it all works. <clears throat> So we'll talk about transfers of IPv4 addresses first. Um, there's three Aaron transfer policies that are available. There's the classic mergers and acquisitions that has been around forever. Um, it's a traditional transfer. It's based on a change in business structure, and it does include company uh, reorganizations, and this is always supported by legal documentation. It's that classic you know, merger acquisition activity. We don't focus on that. that um, we're mostly going to talk about the, the next two. Transfers to specified recipients, that is in our number resource policy manual as number 8.3. And this is one of those IPv4 market transfers. And it's typically based on financial transaction between a source and a recipient, two parties. And it is supported by justified need within the Aaron region. In other words, if you are a recipient of resources under this policy, you have to qualify under an Aaron policy. There is also inter-RIR transfers to specified recipients, and that's NERPM 8.4, and that is very similar to 8.3, but it is um, for transfers that are based outside the region, space that's moving from the Aaron region to another RIR, or space that's moving from another RIR into the Aaron region. But again, it is a, an IPv4 market transfer, and it is based on financial transaction. So transfers to specified recipients, um, just a little brief. Um, uh, blurb about what, what it actually is about and what the criteria are. It basically allows organizations that have unused IPv4 res resources to transfer them to an organization that is in need of IPv4 resources. The policy says that the source has to be a, the current registrant and there can be no disputes over the resources. So Aaron staff has to do a vetting and make, sh make sure that that is the current registrant that is doing the transfer. And um, it, the policy says that that the organization that's received that's the source cannot have received addresses from Aaron for 12 months prior to the transfer, and that's sort of an anti-flipping measure that was put in by the community years ago. They didn't want people coming in and getting space from Aaron and then immediately turning around and selling it, um, you know, a month later. <clears throat> There's also a clause in this policy that says that the source can then not receive additional resources for 12 months after the approval of the transfer or until the exhaustion of Aaron's IPv4 address space. That's no longer applicable, so we don't apply that, and that is actually one of the policy discussions today. Um, the recipient. The recipient has to demonstrate the need for a 24-month supply under current Aaron policy. So this is a really rough graph. Um, it goes back to January of 2015, and it shows that you know we were not doing a lot of specified transfers. Probably seven or eight were getting approved way back when. We had a little spike. And then um, the yellow line in June was when we initiated the uh, waiting list, which is when we no longer had a large enough prefix to satisfy an approved request. And then in September, you can see the red line. That's when we actually ran out of IPv4 resources, and that's when the specified transfers spiked. And that's what we're seeing right now at the same high level, and we expect that to increase. Um, so inter-RIR transfers, um, the main premise of this is that the other RIR that we're doing business with must have reciprocal compatible needs-based policies. That was another thing the community insisted on. We can only do this type of inter-RIR transfer with an RIR that still maintains their needs-based policies. Currently, that is APNIC and recently, most recently, the RIPE NCC. Um, LACNIC is actually talking about the same type of inter rir policy, and AFRINIC is just starting to explore that. So we anticipate eventually that probably those other two RIRs will be doing transfers with us. So the policy says that transfers going from Aaron into another region, <clears throat> it says the source cannot have received V4 address space from Aaron for 12 months prior to the transfer, very similar to 8.3 transfers. Um, it has to be the current registrant and no disputes. Again, same vetting process is involved um, on the part of the staff. And the recipient has to meet the destination RIR's policies. 
And again, there is that 12 month clause that the source cannot um, come in and get resources for 12 months after this, the approval of the transfer or until exhaustion of before the before address space at Aaron. Transfers going coming into Aaron, um, they have got to uh, the recipient has to demonstrate the need for a 24 month supply under current Aaron policy. So this is just sort of high level criteria. Um, this graph is sort of all over the place. Um, but the thing to note, obviously, is once we um, depleted in September, well, actually, it was pretty stable. And then in November, it shot up. And I think a lot of that is because the RIPE NCC implemented their policy in August, and they were sort of getting their stuff together. And we started seeing transfers from them in October and November timeframe. So it has, it has been increasing. And again, we, we expect that to increase um, pretty drastically. OK, so here are some statistics. This is actually up on our website um, at that link below. These are just the resources that have been transferred via these two policies. So 8.3 transfers to specified recipients, 452 prefixes have been transferred, ranging from slash 24s to a slash 10. Um, as a comparison, in July of 2015, there were only 170 prefixes transferred. So in you know five, <coughs> six months, there was quite a drastic increase in the total number of prefixes transferred. Uh, that included 23 ASNs. For inter-RAR transfers, 201 prefixes ranging from slash 24s to uh, slash 13s. And again, for comparison, in July, there was only 45 prefixes transferred, and that was to APNIC. So um, the way it's worked, 188 have gone from Aaron to the APNIC region. 10 have been from Aaron to the right NCC region. And three have been from APNIC into the Aaron region. That's kind of a new thing. There, that, for a long time, it was just from Aaron to the APNIC region. Um, so the reserved IPv4 block for IPv6 deployment. Um, a slash 10 was reserved under policy in April of 2009. Um, that is the slash 10, 23, that one, 28. And to date, 12 slash 24s have been issued. Um, for the first five, five, six years, no one used the policy at all. It never got touched. But in recent months, people are starting to realize that it is there, it is available, and it is fairly easy to use and qualify under. It has to be used to facilitate IPv6 deployment. And the poli policy gives some examples. Um, and it says that it can be used for IPv4 addresses for uh, key dual stack DNS servers and NAT PT or NAT 464 translation. Those are examples. One of the things that the staff is looking for when someone comes in to apply under this policy is that you already have, the organization already has an IPv6 allocation or assignment. We actually require that. You have to have your IPv6 assignment in order to get a slash 24 to facilitate um, your deployment. The policy says one per organization every six months. The slash 24 is the maximum size. And um, this really should be enough to last for several years. You know, there's over 8,000 prefixes, um, slash 24s in this slash 10. And it seems like a good interim option if your IPv4 needs are small. Um, that's what we're mostly seeing right now, the smaller ISPs that are using the policy. So looking at ISP members with who have actually come in to get their IPv6 address space, when we started tracking this um, in 2010, only about 20% of Aaron's ISP members, which was somewhere in the 5,000 range, had gotten their IPv6 uh, allocations. And most recently, in, at the end of Q4, about 48% have now come in to get their, their IPv4 allocations. Um, so we usually show this slide, and then that's the end of it. But Dan had asked me a question saying, well, OK, there's lots of ISP members, but are those the small guys, the big guys? Who's actually getting the space? So we did a little bit more research, and we came up with this. Um, this data. So Aaron has fee categories, and we categorize our membership as extra, extra small to extra, extra large. And you can see that the extra, extra small guys are the ones that are not making great progress. About 22% of them have gotten their IPv6 um, allocations. But as you go up, you know, extra small goes up to 35, 34%, smalls up over 50%, mediums close to 70, larges over 70%. Extra larges are about 78%, and our extra, extra large ISPs are about 85%. So what we're seeing is that the largest ISPs are the ones that are actually leading the way, getting their space, and hopefully encouraging their downstream customers to do the same. And that's all I have. Are there questions?
Hi, Jeff. Jeff Houston, A. Penick. Let me get closer for the webcast, Jeff Houston, A. Penick. Um, you report, Aaron reports transfers in a transfer log service. Um, I'd like to actually note that I find as a consumer of that service, I find this report somewhat unsatisfying. Um, the first instance is transfers are now important, very important for V4. And while Aaron diligently updates its daily stats files every day, it less than diligently updates the log file sometime after the end of each month at an indeterminate date. Right. So the data is at best a week old mm -hmm. and at worst about five or six weeks old. Mm -hmm. For anyone trying to understand what's happening, this is probably not good enough. And I would urge you to take that log seriously and see if you can push it out every day in the same way that you push out all the other stats reports about activity. Mm -hmm. The content of that log is also somewhat unsatisfying, that it does not list the original dates associated with the resource. It simply lists the date of the transfer, and it does not give you any indication of the parties who transferred, whereas in other areas, including the extended stats file, that information is obtainable. So that in order to recreate useful data, I find myself burrowing through the entirety of the Aaron archive right. to actually programmatically discover right. what you already know. Right. And while it's fun for both of us to duplicate this work, to come to the same piece of knowledge, you really could have made my life easier. Mm -hmm. And I'm humbly begging you to do so. Okay. So I would like a slightly more detailed log, mm -hmm. and I'd certainly like it produced daily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So there was... <clears throat> And hold, okay. Um, <clears throat> there was a um, policy proposal that came up a while ago for a much more detailed transfer log file. And um, it got some discussion and uh, ultimately was dropped because it didn't have a lot of support. But that also was a discussion that branched into two directions. One of, is it really belong in the policy manual at all? And the other one is, should a detailed transfer log include such things as pricing? Um, so um, the, uh, I guess the question is, is there a standard format for, much like we have a unified stats format that's almost unified, is there a standard transfer format that would be useful among the RIRs because it would be far better to have one log file format that we issue than three or four of us all doing it differently. Um, thank you, John, for that question. I'll, I'll answer. Um, there is no standard transfer format at this point in time, unfortunately. APNIC update their transfer report daily using a format similar to the stats file including the dates of the original registration, the date of the transfer, and the names of the entities, no pricing. The RIPE NCC do a similar format, produced daily, but don't give the original registration date, just the date of the transfer. And again, it's a case of recreating some data. I would have thought it's not within our, you know, not impossible for the RIRs who are doing this to agree on one format. And I would encourage you and my organization and right to do so and produce the daily information. I'm not sure as registry folk, the price is that relevant to us. That information is really someone else's business. But the nature of where the addresses are moving and who is moving and the dates at which they move and the age of these resources is important. If I could just continue for one second, part of the rationale for doing this was the realization that we'd come to exhaustion with this huge pool of legacy resources that were inefficiently used. And we honestly thought, or at least I did, that the transfer market would unleash some of those old resources and actually alleviate some of these pressures in this strange interregnum of moving to V6. It would be good to understand from stats that that is indeed happening, that those old addresses are actually being mined for transfers and being reused. And that's a good thing. But if your logs don't help us show this, then I think we all get a little bit frustrated. So, uh, you know, I, I think we can do a better job. Do people want to respond to that, Mark? I see you. Uh, so this has been a, um, a 
a sort of side conversation going on with the various our RARs on, on dealing with this. And actually, um, within two weeks, we should have a specification for transfers. Useful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Next. Um, David Farmer, University of Minnesota, Aaron AC. Uh, Leslie, you um, mentioned on the four point, uh, the 410 transfers that you are asking the resource, uh, asking the applicant if they have their V6. Yes. Is that an Aaron allocation or assignment or? Would a provider allocation meet the, the provider the allocation would meet the um, okay okay cool requirement. Thank you. Yep. That's all. I just wanted to clarify. Yep. Absolutely. Yes, Kevin. Leslie, uh, so Kevin Bloomberg, The Wire, and I see a uh, quick question with 4.10 transfers. Are reserved blocks, especially the 4.10, which is a contiguous block, transferable after the fact? I.e., uh, is it? Uh, not prohibited in policy today, is that something we should be looking for in policy if the whole point of this is to have one contiguous route at block? That's actually a really good question and it probably is something to consider because there is no prohibition in the policy at this point. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Very good. Okay, next up, uh, Chair of the AC. Daniel Alexander will give the uh, AC update. Morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. One of the, the main reasons for this, you know, PPC is so we can gain feedback on some of the proposals that the Advisory Council is working on because we're you know, tasked with developing these proposals and forwarding the ones to the board that we actually feel that the community wants to actually implement the change to how Aaron does their work. So right now we're working on several draft policies which are in an earlier state of the, the process where we're crafting the language, find, getting feedback, finding out the, you know, the pros and cons of those when they get to a particular state where we feel that that language is is stable and has a fair amount of consensus the the proposal is moved to a recommended state where we feel okay this is pretty much ready to go we want that final feedback from the community so you'll see that there's actually two being discussed today in a recommended state and two being discussed today that are still in a draft once those recommended proposals are to a point where we feel they're ready to go, then we forward them to the, to the board after a last call period for people having an opportunity to have their final say. And then the board reviews whether or not the pro process has been followed and then actually implements the change. So today we have uh, two drafts or two proposals in a recommended state, two in a, in a, that are a work in progress that are still in a draft state. There's also three other uh, proposals on our docket, but will not actually be discussed here today because they're still in an earlier stage where we're crafting the language and they'll likely be discussed at the, the next Aaron meeting in April. Some of the, the other work that we do in addition to the, the proposals that are on our docket is we often take feedback from the staff and they, do, they provide that to us via a policy experience report at the Aaron meetings. And there's two topics, you know, one of them we just were talking about here um, that we've been debating within the AC and that is the, the routability of micro assignments you know, through section 410. There was actually a, a proposal uh, done a while ago, 2014-22, uh, that was discussing the, the, minimal, the minimum allocations that are made from that pool because there's questions about the routability if somebody came and said, I need a slash you know, 26 from that allocation. 
how, how successful they would be. That proposal was actually abandoned, but we now also have, you know, a new topic to discuss, which we were just covering earlier. There's also um, a topic that we're dealing with that Leslie brought up in her report as well, that the return language around 8.2 transfers, some view that as um, an issue because it, it tends to frighten some people away from actually coming and doing the transfers when in fact it really, it shouldn't be that kind of a, a problem. So we're, we're discussing whether or not that language should be removed. We'll also talk a little later today at the end of this session about these PPC formats because we're always interested in feedback on how we can improve um, these meetings and what data could be provided in these meetings that the NANOG community finds useful. And we've also been working on uh, different ways to collect community feedback via online polls or other mechanisms. And then the final um, topic that the AC has really been working on is how to simplify the, the policy manual. You know, we've spent years and years kind of applying band-aids to different situations, um, trying to, to fix smaller problems. And as a result, the, the policy manuals become somewhat cumbersome, rather large. So now that we're, we're in a depleted state and V4 is kind of done, how would how can we scale back that language so people can get their, their job done and it's done in a clear um, set of policies. So with that, we can jump right into the, the policy discussions. You want me to switch this or? I can. Okay, okay moving right ahead. Um, our first discussion up is draft policy 2015-2, uh, modify 8.4 inter IR transfers to specified recipients. Chris Tassett, come on up. Thank you, John. Which way is it? Um, I use the arrows. Oh, there was a, okay, got it. All right, thanks. So, sorry? Oh, oh, I see. Oh, sorry, uh, I left one button. Um, down here, I think that looks uh, like a podium. Uh, this one? Yeah, I'll just do that right there. Okay, thanks. Okay, now it should. All right, now it should be good. All right, so um, the uh, problem statement that left uh, that, um, led to this draft policies uh, relates to uh, parties getting uh, numbering resources based on a 24-month supply via the transfer market and then uh, having an uh, unexpected change in business plans where they operate uh, multinationally across RIRs and being unable to transfer any of those resources out uh, for 12 months as a result of Aaron's anti-flip provisions. So this is the uh, text of the current uh, bullet that we're focusing on, the fourth bullet of section 8.4 of the NERPM, and it includes uh, language that relates to both transfers, allocations, or assignments of IPv4 resources and creates that anti-flip restriction. Uh, so this proposal sought to remove the word transfer from that bullet, thereby enabling uh, transfers of numbering resources to another RIR after somebody does uh, receive uh, resources via a transfer in case their business plans change and they need to uh, reallocate some of their resources across other portions of their network that happen to be situated in other regions. Um, so that is the, the rationale and it enables those numbering resources uh, to not be locked into Aaron's who is for the 12 month period but to actually be transferred to the other RIR. 
Um, so I just want to stress that the underlying reason for this is that uh, eight-point tree transfers are approved for a 24-month supply and on occasion a business model may change after one receives resources under 8.3 uh, and those changes may require the use of those resources elsewhere in the world. Uh, but that this policy language that was proposed is not intended to uh, affect assignments and allocations which would still be subject to the 12-month restriction. So that, that was the original proposal. <clears throat> Um, when discussion was sought on PPML, there were basically two uh, views, if I could put it. One was, this isn't Aaron's problem, we shouldn't bother with this. Uh, the other was, Aaron members operating uh, global networks prefer to deal with one IRIR as much as possible, and the policy, this policy should reduce incentives to game the system, which is possible under, uh, under the current system. Uh, it's possible to circumvent this anyway by, by using uh, alternate means. Um, so based, however, on the feedback that we got, which, uh, which suggested that this may not be, there may not be sufficient anti-flipping protection, we are now proposing a further amendment to the policy which hasn't been formally uh, tendered yet. And uh, that amendment would create the necessity for some sort of affiliation relationship based on ownership and control between the uh, entity that's under um, Aaron's uh, jurisdiction and the other entity that would be the recipient of the resources. The amendment really is largely based, based on U.S. statutory provisions that are commonly used in corporate law to define affiliation relationships relating to ownership and control. So therefore, <clears throat> under this proposed language, the fourth bullet of 8.4 would be changed to read as you see on the screen. The red text would be the, the new text. And basically, I, it, it looks a bit lengthy, but basically it just says that there is an affiliation relationship between the two, a corporate affiliation relationship such as one that would be recognized under U.S. law. <clears throat> uh, this restriction, of course, wouldn't, in, uh, wouldn't affect M&A transfers. And uh, because we, want, we didn't want to have the definition of control embedded in here, you need to have, when you talk about ownership and control in legal terms, you have to define what control means. We didn't want to clutter this bullet, so we're suggesting adding a definition of control to the definition section of the NERPM that would be used uh, here. And in fact, probably this is the only place I think that it would, would be used. Uh, so that is the upcoming proposal. And uh, at this point, I guess I'd really appreciate subject to the uh, chair's guidance to see what input the community may have on that uh, proposed language before we decide whether to go ahead with it or not. So the floor is open. Come speak at the mics if you want to talk about this proposal. Matt Petak, Yahoo. I'm, I'm sorry, but your amended language makes my head hurt. I think it's language only a lawyer would love. Um, I, I understand that there's a desire to try to, to firm it up as much as possible, but we've been looking for a while now to simplify the NRPM, and as, as much as I, I sympathize with your desire here, I do not think this goes in the direction of simplifying the NRPM. I'm sorry. Joe Provo. Joe Provo, Google, wondering where the sweet spot is for the mic. Okay, wrong side. Um, yeah. Uh, I like the uh, the retention of the concept of uh, that that we brought up in the previous meetings that, that we wanted to guard against the anti flip. Um, to uh, to my colleague from Yahoo's point, perhaps moving it into definition is the right place. So the NERPM itself reads clean, but the people that want to dig into the legalese can dig into the legalese. Uh, I'm sorry, so I'm having trouble here. <laughs> uh, to my colleague from Yahoo's point that. Um, uh, moving the, the, the new text into the definitions may help 
preserve the visual cleanliness and be able to have somebody who wants to dig into, gosh, what does control really mean, be able to understand it. Um, uh, in general, support the direction. This okay, is thanks. It, well, the uh, the definition of control is moved is to be moved in the definition section. So I agree with that. Yeah. So I think that that the my my point is that perhaps the the concern over the uh, the 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 cruft and the nerpum it's not going to be within the block, so it actually is legible. But those who wish to dig into the meaning, I, I don't think we can get away from having this block of legalese as you guys have explored. So what I'm hearing is there's a tension between uh, the complexity of the wording and the desire to uh, to ensure that we do the maximum amount of uh, guarding against abuse of the uh, of flipping. So that seems to be the tension I'm hearing. Any other feedback on this? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next up we have uh, recommended draft policy 2015-5 uh, out of region use uh, and uh, I'll do the, uh, I'm going to do the introduction, I'm going to have the AC member come up and present and then you'll moderate the discussion. Uh, just uh, trying to sequence here. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, so the history of this, 2015-5, out of region use. Um, it originated as Allen Policy Proposal 2019. Uh, does sound like there's a lot of policy proposals. Uh, 219, which was submitted in May of, this, of last year. The AC Shepherds, the people who are chartered with working this policy to a good state, is Tina Morris and David Huberman. It was presented at Aaron 36 uh, in this past October, was discussed there, and uh, afterwards was uh, rec advanced to recommended draft policy. The text is online and in your discussion guide. Um, and uh, basically would allow an organization to receive number resources from Aaron for out of region use as long as the applicant is currently using at least the equivalent of a slash 22 of IPv4 a slash 44 of IPv6 or one ASN within the Aaron service region. In addition, the applicant must have a real and substantial connection with Aaron in the region, which the applicant shall be responsible for proving. Um, it would increase the complexity a little bit of our staff review, uh, meaning there would be criteria that would have to be applied, but at least they're clear criteria. Um, and that means an in increase in vetting work. Um, it does, uh, require some coordination uh, with council uh, regarding the costs and implementation because uh, we would be in some cases dealing with entities that uh, where the one contacting us is outside of the region potentially uh, because a business unit of a company is, even though it may have resources in this region, the office that's contacting us might be in another location. There's no legal risks, it's just the cost to deal with that. Um, the uh, implementation issues, um, so uh, additional review steps, we need to do the training steps to write that out, train staff. And then um, we may have a requirement for Unicode character sets because some of the parties we'd be dealing with uh, may not be able to express in uh, simple ASCII. And so um, that would keep uh, Mark and company busy for a few days. And uh, we don't know how much of that or where it would occur, uh, but uh, parts of this could lead us to uh, having to do coding changes to make a more flexible registration system and accommodate Unicode. Not that that's not good work to do, but it's still work. Um, and that would Im that aspect could take longer uh, than the rest of the policy. Uh, so now I'm going to have the presentation by the AC, uh, and I will have, uh, um, yeah, Tina come up and give that presentation. Sorry. I always have to blank out at least once. And let me just get your slides up. Oh, look at that. Go. All right. So um, basically, as, as John just uh, explained, you know, we've gone through several iterations of this policy because the current NRPM does not clearly f um, allow or forbid out of region use. Um, this is our most successful attempt at um, 
getting this policy through. Uh, basically, if you have air and registered resources, you can use them outside the service region. Um, they're valid for justification for additional number resources, um, provided the applicant has a real substantial connection to the air and region, um, as, as stated. And the policy is somewhat lengthy, but I believe it's quite clear at this, at this point. It's easy to follow. Um, it's a long policy, though. Um, let's see. At Aaron 36, um, we were able to kind of get through the noise and everybody's fear about out-of-region use policy and get to the actual language. And once we did that, we found there was a great deal of support. Um, we actually had a unanimous show of support to move this policy forward, and the AC meeting, we moved it to recommended draft policy. Um, since that time, there's been no discussion whatsoever on PPML. Um, it's actually a little bit disturbing as the shepherd of the policy to know whether everybody's supporting that move to recommended draft policy or not, but there's been no discussion whatsoever. Um, so we're just looking for support. Is this a good thing? Should we move this forward? Um, is it, does this solve a real problem for you? Or is there a problem that was still with this um, policy language? Now, Aaron is... Uh, uh, on the Board of Trustees and we'll moderate the discussion of the policy. So people who want to speak on this policy, please come forth to the microphones. The microphones remain open. Don't all line up at once. Matt Petak, Yahoo. We're, we're still talking about this? I, I thought it was done. Well, what more talking do you need? Uh, it's just the formal process. We had to move it to recommended last. Um, last call would be next after um, this meeting if we get support. We just need support. Okay. Do we need to like all stand up and do jumping jacks and support? Or, or we, we we did a unanimous show of hands. I thought that was enough. Here's yeah. here's support. Well, it was a draft policy at that state, so we're going through. So then we had to move it to recommended. Now we're at recommended. Now, now we're at recommended, so we can all support again and yes. say we still like it. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Good. Then then we still like it. Yes. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Bob Evans, Bob Evans, Fiber Internet Center. Um, yeah, I, I support this, but I'm just wondering in this long list of demonstrating, um, how much of this list is going to actually be required by staff in order to get something acknowledged? Because my experience has been often this kind of text is somewhat used as an excuse and there's just a huge list here and i think the text needs to define that all of it's not required does it so this um, is request for staff feedback pardon is this is a request for staff feedback no it's a criticism of staff using the text yeah but Will staff require all the bullets or what percentage of the bullets? And this is not really clearly established. Um, the language here. is these are elements the staff may use to consider, and it will be left to the staff's discretion. That's what I don't like. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So just to be clear, are you in favor of the policy proposal, or are you opposed to it as a written? I'm opposed to it as it's written due to the fact that staff can't say oh you got two of these demonstrated now i want i want three you see this is what's happened in the past to a lot of people so i just want to kind of clarify that okay thank you thanks very much do you want to speak to them? okay Good. um so the language that prefaces that long list is simply being incorporated in the Aaron region shall not be sufficient on its own to prove that an entity is carrying on business in the Aaron region in a meaningful manner. So if you send us just the incorporation paper, the staff says, we've already got guidance. That in and of itself doesn't cover it. Please provide us something additional. Methods that entities, so this is what you would do, methods that entities may consider using, including cumulatively, to prove they are carrying on business in a meaningful manner include demonstrating X, demonstrating Y, demonstrating Z, demonstrating J, demonstrating K, demonstrating L, demonstrating W. Um, any other method that, and the last one, any other method that the entity considers appropriate. The 
The weight of all accorded to all of the above factors shall be determined solely by Aaron. So, so to answer that, we're not going to say you need to provide us all of this. You need to provide us what you consider credible information. And if we don't think that's enough, we may ask you to supply another one of those documents. It is not a you must supply all of these. In some cases, it's very apparent when someone comes to us that they're operating in the region. We have had cases in the last few years where we've had entities whose um, ability to show that they're operating in the region is tenuous at best. And, uh, and so that's why it's hard for us to be more specific. However, that's how we would implement the language as written. Um, to the extent that people want different language, they should definitely propose it. But as written, we would uh, take what you give us and if we thought we needed more, we would suggest that you go back to the list and give us one or more elements. But it is not a statement that says we require all of those as written. Thanks for the feedback. And uh, just to validate, does that change your uh, support for this policy proposal as written? I guess so. And if it becomes a problem in the future, I'll let you know. But the fact that an, I'm an entity, I can file a DBA and have a business. I don't need to be incorporated. And I can actually see staff actually ask for that and, you know, create a process that's longer than it needs to be. So that's what I'm concerned about as we move forward with all this legal language that my peer from Yahoo there mentioned. I, I just hate to see stuff like that that's not definitive enough. I think maybe if you said two of these, then the staff maybe can't be so liberal about their opinion, something like that. I'll go ahead and propose some language. Great. Thank you for the feedback. Mr. Provo. Uh, Joe Provo, Google, uh, just quick support. Yes, yay. I agree with my colleague from Yahoo that, hey, yes, let's keep going. Thank you. Mike, jo <coughs> Mike Joseph, Oracle. I strongly support this policy, and I also want to thank uh, all the folks who've worked on it for the past two years uh, to bring us to where we are. Um, I know that I know that some folks don't find this uh, to be complete or, or perfect. Very few policies that come through here are. But in particular, uh, you know, I think it took a lot of a lot of hard work by all the folks who've done this, and, and a lot of discussions uh, of which many of which I've been a part for the last couple of years to get this to where it is. Uh, so this may not be a perfect policy, but I think this we finally found a, a set of guidelines and language that is able to address uh, the needs of uh, various constituents in the community as well as Aaron's staff. So I strongly urge us to move forward with this policy now that we're at recommended uh, draft state. Uh, and we can, we can come revisit it later if we feel the need, but it's long overdue <laughs> to get this on the books. So thank you and strongly in support of this policy. Thank you for your feedback. Owen. Owen DeLong, Akamai, Aaron AC. Um, for those that are wondering why we're talking about this again, I'll refer you to the minutes of the September AC conference call uh, from last year, and that should pretty well cover it. Um, I'm in support of the policy as written as I was at the September call. Thank you. Uh, Brandon Ross, Network Utility Force, I was going to make another comment and then actually read it and figured out that the comment I was going to make is unnecessary. So I'll just stand here and say I very much support the policy. Thank you very much. Mr. Tassett. Chris Tassett, uh, Tassett Law, Aaron AC. I just wanted to make a remark. I think the intention of that list was actually to be a helpful guide for the kinds of evidence that people could actually provide rather than being any kind of restrictive or or comprehensive requirement. If you look at the language before, and especially the word include, it is an inclusive list. It is to help people get some guidance rather than it just being a totally open-ended and you have to stab in the dark, take a stab in the dark of whether Aaron will find the kinds of evidence you're supplying to be helpful. That was the intent of that language. Um, there has to be, uh, in my view, some discretion allowed to Aaron's staff to assess this. Uh, these sorts of tests are based on the kinds of tests that courts use to assume jurisdiction over parties in legal proceedings, and it's the same kind of substantial connection test. And yes, somebody has to turn their mind 
to how that test is going to apply to the facts. Aaron will, staff will develop the expertise to do that as it goes through these over time, and I'm sure that it will do so responsibly as it always does. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Woodfield. So, sorry. So, yes, I'm in support of the policy. Hi, Chris Woodfield, Twitter. Um, first off, I am some in support of the policy. Um, I have a question about, is there any current documentation? I realize this will make this largely an academic question, but is there a current definition in the policy of out-of-region use uh, other, than, other than what I assume is just assigning an Aaron IP to a network, network or a device element that's outside the region? Is there anything more specific than that in the current policy? No, just outside of Aaron. It does not um, get more specific to where that would apply. Okay. Thank you. Microphones are open. Any other feedback? Okay. Do we need to do a yes. show of hands? Okay. All right. So we're going to do a show of hands for uh, first in support and then uh, following that uh, not in support of 2015-5. So at this time, please raise your hands if you are in support of forwarding 2015-5. Keep them nice and high. Keep them in the air, please. Nice and high. Let's leave it good on numbers. Okay. Thank you. And now please uh, raise your hand if you are not in support of forwarding this uh, recommended draft policy 2015-5. Keep them nice and high. All right, thank you very much. We have tabulation going on now. Okay, for 2015-5, we have 50 people in the room, uh, 21 in, su in support, in favor, and zero against. Were there any online? Four, four, four of those were online. Ah, okay, four of those online. Uh, this information will be forwarded to the AC. Thank you very much for your feedback on 2015-5. Ah, lovely. Okay, moving right ahead. Um, uh, next up, we have the uh, discussion of draft policy at Aaron 2015-7, simplified requirements for demonstrated need for IPv4 transfers. Kevin Bloomberg. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, show you the problem statement for this policy. This is an overview. Uh, in your discussion guide is actually a much longer problem statement. But um, for, for those in the room that uh, might not be familiar with this policy already, I wanted to sort of uh, uh, bring it down. So currently, Aaron Transfer Policy uh, inherits demonstrated need. Uh, demonstrated need is probably one of the most talked about aspects uh, when it comes to getting space uh, from Aaron um, and uh, anything related to a transfer today um, takes the demonstrated need requirements that are in Section 4 um, and applies them to Section 8. Um, the, the issue is that most of Section 4 was designed around a free pool. Um, many of the caveats were are designed around a free pool, and then even as we got closer to the end of the free pool runout, they were further uh, locked in more. Um, as an example, went from 12-month needs justification to a three-month needs justification within inside of the free pool. There were other changes as well over time as we got closer to runout. So this proposal seeks to simplify the needs assessment process for 8.3 transfers while still allowing organizations with corner case requirements to use specific policies in, in Section uh, 4. Okay, 
So um, just to start here, uh, staff has said that they will apply this draft policy, and this is a draft policy. So we're looking for your feedback on good things, bad things, do it just like this, et cetera. And there's uh, some staff and legal feedback already we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the original intent from uh, a drafting was to put it in an 8.1, a new section. Um, and later on, staff uh, actually said, no, we'll, we'll just apply it to section 8.3 and 8.4, keep it similar, don't need to apply a new section to it. So I wouldn't worry too much about the specific wording, uh, but more the, the general concept. And if you do see an issue with this, um, or you do like it or don't like it, that's what we're more interested in from a feedback point of view. So the change to uh, needs base uh, would be IPv4 transfer recipients must demonstrate and an officer must attest, again, I'm paraphrasing this, that they will use at least 50% of their aggregate um, IPv4 addresses, including the requested resources on an operational network within 24 months. Organizations that don't meet this criteria can use something from Section 4 that, uh, it, if that is the case. So staff and legal did come back to us, um, and uh, they said that this policy language would apply to 24 months needed assessments for 8.3 and 8.4 transfers and pre-approvals as well. Um, in order to verify the demonstrated need of 50%, the policies of Section 4 would still apply, so this wouldn't be an anchor in Section 8 on its own, by itself, standalone. Demonstrated need is, is well talked about in Section 4, so the parameters around the demonstrated need would still be used from Section 4. Um, this would po potentially allow organizations to get a greater amount of space than they could car currently get under existing policy, uh, could be implemented as written, and again, the change, they do it in Section 8.3 and 8.4 and not create a new section. Legal assessment, we always love uh, when the lawyers uh, give us their advice. It, we are silly if we don't heed them. Um, no material legal issues exist. Wonderful to see. Um, it would. The, the next point was uh, sort of a, a note to readers. This policy, if adopted, would significantly lower the degree of utilization requirement and permit significantly larger transfers, which is also what staff said. This is, in effect, a bridge between maintaining a lighter needs-based structure that permits substantially greater transfers dot, 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 my, my emphasis, without removing needs basis completely, which is something that the community has been uncomfortable with in the past. So this is a stepping stone, of a very large, in my mind, stepping stone, but still a stepping stone. Um, and the last part was an issue that does not have to be resolved with this policy um, is whether an acquiring party taking appropriate advantage of such a policy change ought to have a corollary duty to fully disclose to Aaron whether they may have use of, an, of any other resources by agreement that effectively reduces their overall number of resources. So one of the issues that we're seeing um, and uh, one of the issues that we're seeing in the region is that there are corporations that may have uh, leasing agreements that are not on the books with Aaron, they, they have no idea that you're also happen to be leasing space from over here or that you've got an intent for, for space over here and things like that. So um, to me, what the council's comments, and by all means, if I'm wrong, let me know, um, is if we're going to make things that much easier, maybe we need to, you should be disclosing it as well. Um, but at the same time, he's saying this doesn't necessarily need to be there today. This might be an issue at a later time, and it's something to consider. So what I'd love to hear from everybody in the room, or those that uh, want to do it, do you support this uh, as written? Do you support it with changes? Do you not support it? Um, and any feedback on top of, yes, more than just plus one, I support it, would be really helpful to... Uh, uh, to the, the shepherd. I'm not the shepherd for this, but this will be uh, detailed to the shepherd. Yeah. And just note that the uh, council comment um, is simply um, people have to uh, demonstrate when doing a transfer that it will result in a certain utilization percentage. That demonstration and the percentage calculated is only meaningful if we know the total resources that they control. And so 
To the extent that that's expected, we need to be very under clear of that. If it's a percentage of whatever resources I happen to tell Aaron, I feel like I control, but not all the resources, then anyone can qualify just by not identifying resources that they might hold in other regions. So it's just a note that when we calculate a percentage, it's only as accurate as what people want to tell us. And if the intent is that they tell us all resources they control, then we should, that should be made clear. Hello, uh, Donnie Roisman with uh, SoftLayer. I think um, I think it's a good. I, generally, as you guys probably already know, I think uh, all needs-based assessment for transfer should be eliminated entirely. Um, I think anything that gets us uh, there is a good idea. I think this is a, a decent stepping stone. If the, still the member community at large is not ready for the uh, the end game, which is eliminating all needs-based, in my opinion, um, I think we should at least go through and uh, make it as easy as possible to complete the transfers that businesses need to complete. Donnie, quick question. Um, from a text point of view, um, do you find that the text as written is simple for you as an, as an organization or in general uh, to use in implementation? Are there some more simplifications minus removing needs completely, which is not what this policy is? Um, are there any other changes that you could see or you like this text as written? So I, I thought I liked it as written until what John just said. And I want to Get a clarification. So this text doesn't specify resources in the Aaron region or resources globally. Is the intent to be resources in the Aaron region or resources globally? Um, wow, I have to push at the same time as I am flipping through the document. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so if you look at the text, it's ambiguous. It doesn't say um, one way or the other, but it does say um, policy statement. IPV4 transfer recipients must demonstrate, parentheses, and an officer of the requesting organization must attest that they will use at least 50% of their aggregate IPV4 addresses, including the requested ones, on an operational network within 24 months. So we're going to be getting attestations from the people making the request. They say, hey, here's what I'm going to transfer, and it's going to be 50% within 50% utilized. My only question is, absent any clarity, if someone says, here's the resources I have in the Aaron region that I control, or here's the resources that I have globally, if there's guidance to the staff about which it is we're looking for, I'd like to see it in the policy. Absent that, we're going to take anything they say. That's all I was pointing out. Yeah, so if, if uh, I, don't, I don't have the NERP in front of me, but I believe Section 4 only has to do with Aaron resources when you're going back and showing utilization of previously assigned Aaron resources, right? Um, it's not clear either way, particularly in a world where we're issuing resources for out-of-region use. It's not clear at all. So I'm just, the policy intent is unclear. I'd like to make sure that folks understand we will implement it generously and if you expected us to get attestations of all resources or just resources in the region, you should make that clear. So two comments to that. The first is the more resources that you're able to detail, the larger the request can be. Um, so there, there is actually a benefit the more you detail. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is, and I think that we need to take this back and think about it as well. How does 2015-5, which just had a lot of hands up, which is the out-of-region policy, apply and meld into this policy? Uh, does this policy, um, is this policy straightforward enough that it doesn't touch the out-of-region um, in any way? Or, you know, and that's maybe something that we need to uh, take back and think about as well. The, the other nature is, Sometimes people have control of address blocks that are not listed to them, meaning it's, for, for example, provider assigned, okay? They've got a provider assigned address block. They're coming looking for more resources, and if they count the provider assigned block, they don't qualify, so obviously they shouldn't. My question is, should they be? What, do you, what did you want us to do? Did you want us to count the provider assigned or not? Because we need to guide them to what they're attesting to. And that's my only point, is that we will attempt to take 
any attestation that attests to any of the resources that we can validate and hits 50%, but it might not be what you people in the room think, and that's what council's comment is too. Yeah, so I, uh, so yeah, so the, like I said, I, I had one opinion until I heard that, and now I realize the word aggregate IPv4 addresses, which um, uh, the section four says previous, previously assigned resources, mm -hmm. which uh, makes it a little clearer that it would be, because we're all, we, we're talking about Aaron, so it'd be, Aaron assigned resources, at least that's how I would interpret it. We probably need to tweak that um, uh, to remove the aggregate IPv4 addresses um, to remove the ambiguity, I think. Thank you. To ask the question, if that said the aggregate of previously assigned Aaron resources, would you support the policy? Yes, I absolutely would. Oh, okay. So you believe it's supportable with that change, but you would not otherwise? Yes. Okay. Matt Petak, Yahoo. Uh, I will just note that section four phrases it as ISPs must have efficiently utilized all allocations in aggregate to at least 80% and at least 50%, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't say Aaron or global. And uh, from the past dozen years of, of advising on paperwork, we like the flexibility of being able to interpret that as we saw fit for whether we listed just Aaron resources or global resources. Um, I, I think we might need to get more feedback from the community at large before we decide to lock that in because that will impact many companies' behaviors in terms of <clears throat> address utilization in different regions. I generally support this. I, I do see some definite challenges in the, shall I say, conflicts with Section 4. I, I think this actually highlights that we're probably going to need to go back and revisit Section 4's needs-based guidelines in a big way after this, but for this particular section on transfers, yes, I support it, and I actually like the ambiguity of not specifying whether it's global or Aaron or whoever else's blocks. Thank you. So uh, one thing else to consider is if we do uh, specify it to the region, would this then apply to 8.4 transfers? So, so uh, for an, this was meant to apply to both 8.3 and 8.4 transfers. Uh, we could have one piece of language that's specified in the Aaron region for an 8.3, and we could add in the other piece of text for 8.4 just to differentiate a little bit. Um, so just uh, that's another piece of feedback that we'll we'll take to the shepherd. Jeff Houston, AP, neither for nor against, but certainly having a common problem. When this discussion about ambiguity here, you previously mentioned the leasing word. And indeed, that's one of these other areas of profound ambiguity. Is our registry a registry that is tantamount to title or tantamount to operational control? Because leasing exposes that difference where the, if you will, title entity is someone other than the entity currently using those addresses. In APNIC, we're struggling around this because we don't quite understand how to reflect a leasing arrangement in the details of our policies in our registry. And I suspect the creative ambiguity is, is flooding in here, where someone who is leasing is, I suppose, in a rather strange position of how to declare that interest back into an Aaron registry, and it exposes that fundamental question. So without saying for or against, I'd certainly be interested, and I am interested, in watching how you folk in this region a kind of dealing with this leasing issue and how it is certainly possible today to gain control of an address quite legitimately without being reflected in the registry and through various letters of authority get it out into the routing system but the registry doesn't actually reflect that so i'm certainly interested as an observer yeah. that's an excellent point jeff if you follow council's comment he, he notes while not necessary for resolving this policy at this time it does raise the question specifically, we would be interpreting this policy by default as, uh, as a title question. Who is the assigned owner of the rights of record of an address block? But it does raise the question of, are uh, we supposed to ask someone to attest not only for the, uh, the rights that they directly hold, but also for those that they might control indirectly? And that's not necessary to pass this policy, but the community should understand if it doesn't, if it wants those included, most certainly the present text does not address that. Uh, 
Hello, uh, Derek Lazaro, uh, University of Southern California. This is my first time here, a very interesting discussion. Um, one thing that uh, isn't entirely clear to me, just as I look at the text of the policy statement, it says that uh, transfer recipients must demonstrate and an officer must attest. And um, so the question I would have just reading that sort of on the face of the language is, would the attestation of an officer be sufficient demonstration? In other words, is there some additional supporting documentation? And you know, like the other one that we saw with sort of the examples, uh, what, what, what would that look like? So the way this works right now is we work with the requester to make sure we can approve the request. When we're completely done with that, we take the material and we say, now with this cover letter, have your officer attest to that. But we work with the requester to make sure that they qualify. And then the officer attestation is just certifying that what we've received is, is accurate. So it, we process the request first, then we attest to have it in our records so that you folks know we're processing accurate requests. John, to clarify, the officer attestation within the, the idea of using it in the community has been so that um, fairly boisterous uh, predictions um, get uh, brought down to reality through an officer attesting to those rather than just some marketing person? Yes, <laughs> but furthermore, um, a, a, um, a representation by an officer or company is a different thing than a representation by anyone else in the company. Same. Yeah. Matt Petak, Yahoo, with kind of a dumb question for clarification. Um, on the question of title versus leasing arrangements, does Aaron have a particular stance on the same block of addresses being used by multiple companies to justify additional transfer of resources? If, for example, you have leasing entity A, that has a block of addresses that are in, say, uh, an access network pool. And it is being made use of by ISPs B, C, D, and E. And it happens to be a very, very densely utilized pool. Would Aaron have an issue if entities B, C, D, and E all pointed to it and said, look, we've got this 95% utilized block that's under our control we should get more space, or would they go back and say, okay, you can't all claim that same block as justification. Only one guy really gets to use that. We have not had that occur. I will say that we actually look at the address blocks that parties uh, are listed as the address holder in the registry, and then we do look at provider assigned space to them as well. And both of those are exclusive arrangements. We do not have a, a group uh, sharing uh, that we've used to justify resources in the past, you would need to write some very cool policy to make that happen. <laughs> okay, so this is uncharted territory. I like it. Thank you. Just based on time uh, and the wonderful carpool discussion, um, we're, um, we're going to need to close the mics on this policy. Uh, we'll bring have it up on the PPML as well and probably more than uh, at the June, sorry, at the April uh, meeting as well. Thank you. Okay, moving right ahead, we're down to our um, uh, our second draft, uh, recommended draft policy. Uh, it's recommended draft policy 2511, and uh, it's removed transfer policy language, uh, which is only applied pre-exhaustion. So, um, I will do the introduction. 2015-11, uh, uh, the history is Aaron policy proposal uh, 225, which was submitted in September of last year. Uh, the shepherds are Milton Mueller and Robert Seastrom. It was presented at the October meeting. It advanced to recommended draft policy after the meeting in December. Uh, the text is online and in our discussion guide. Calls for the removal of language in 8.3 and 8.4 that sets a condition on the amount of time that must pass before the source of an 8.3 or 8.4 may request an additional IP address space as the recipient. Now, it's removing that language because the language uh, is only operational up until runout. And, uh, and folks who may not have missed this, our free pool ran out in September of 2015. Um, per the policy text, due to IPv4 depletion, Aaron staff no longer applies the 12 month lockout uh, to people who have been previously assigned a resource. We do note that there's 
other language that we do apply having to do with organizations um, that are, from being a source in a transfer if they've been a recipient of space, but that's different text and not affected. Um, and that would remain in place. The uh, policy can be written, uh, implemented as written, the legal assessment, no material legal issues. Uh, it would have minimum resource impact because effectively we're already operating under it. Uh, we would just need to reflect our guidelines, um, uh, but it's nominal. And I'll now turn it over to the AC for their presentation. And coming up is Kevin Bloomberg. Good uh, morning again. So uh, I'm going to run through this one a little faster, if that's OK with everybody. We spent a little bit more time on the last policy. Um, I think the, uh, the bulk of it is this is policy that was time limited um, for when we ran in um, when we hit uh, free pool exhaustion. Um, in Montreal, uh, staff were asked, and uh, Leslie, you're here, so I'd, I'd appreciate just confirming this, that irrespective if space came back and Aaron suddenly had a free pool again, a limited little free pool again, this policy would still not apply because it was a point in time policy. Once the um, policy, once that uh, clock hit, this policy portion was done. So one of the main reasons for this is any extraneous policy in the NRPM um, leads to confusion. People don't know that this policy is ineffective. Staff know it's ineffective. Some of the people in this room might know it's ineffective. But when you're reading a policy and trying to figure out how you're going to do, deal with space, you don't know that. So it's, it's a massive confusion level for uh, leaving this type of text in here. And that's why this is being done. Um, so for the discussion part, what I wanted to bring up was the um, when we move a policy from draft to recommended, the AC does a statement of conformance to say that a policy is technically sound, it's fair and impartial, um, et cetera. And this was the policy statement from um, us moving this from a draft to recommended state. And what I'd like to ask is, is there anybody here who does not uh, believe that we should move this forward, that there are issues still with this to remove the inoperative text, or do you support it? Um, if there's no discussion, if it's a yes or a no, and there's no real discussion, what I'd like to do is move it to a hands, just a show of hands, just for expedience. But if, if you want to have discussion, by all means, let, let us know. So we'll wait a couple seconds. If anybody would like discussion on it versus just the show of hands to show support or non-support. Perfect. All right. OK. Uh, our tabulation engine is being set up. There she is. Sorry, OK. So we're going to ask two questions. The first is going to be looking for a show of support of Aaron 2-2015-11, remove transfer language, which only apply pre-exhaustion of IPv4 pool. And then I will ask for anybody who is not in favor. So at this time, please raise your hand if you are in favor of Aaron 2015-11. Keep them nice and high. Thank you very much. And please raise your hand if you are not in support of 2015-11. Keep your hands up nice and high. Thank you very much. Okay, for 2015-11, we have 23 in, what is, what's the number in the room? 50 in the room, 6 in chat, uh, 18 in favor in the room, 5 in favor in chat for a total of 23, and 0 against. 
Thank you very much for your feedback. This will be passed to the AC. Very good. Okay. And uh, now we are uh, getting towards the end. We have the update by Dan on Aaron public policy consultations. All right. So first I just wanted to thank everyone for their feedback. The AC actually does find this very useful and being able to talk to you about the, the language in these proposals is very useful to us. Um, I really wanted to just also kind of give an update. These PPCs, they, they primarily are a, a tool for the AC to use in, in developing these proposals. But we also want to be able to, you know, have both a conversation with the, the community and also provide information that people may find useful. Um, so when we look at prior feedback, I just wanted to, you know, provide a quick update. Some of the things that have changed, you know, since we started doing these, because they continue to evolve. Um, you know, based on this feedback, one of the things that we we did was during the joint meetings in October, we stopped having these sessions during an ad hoc meeting because a lot of people felt they were redundant. So we started just having these on standalone meetings. One of the other things that we've also started doing is we changed the way that the advisory council um, works with the program committee in coordinating these. And then we were also trying to um, craft a little different presentations like Leslie gave in the beginning of some of the data that we provide, more like statistical information about transfers, things that are going on um, with the registry. And, you know, with that, we're also always open or curious about, you know, your feedback on different things that you would like to see, information you would um, find helpful, you know, from the registry or from the advisory council. And with that, I'd like to just open up the mics and if anybody has any thoughts, please let us know. Microphones are open. Remote mics. Anyone have thoughts or comments on this topic? Matt Petak, Yahoo. I just want to give a thumbs up for the format. I like the cherry picking of hot topics, keeping the topics flowing quickly, and uh, not turning it into the, the three hour long snooze fest that had been in the past. Awesome work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. 100% of those who spoke were in favor. Noted. <laughs> okay. okay. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, as Dan said, this is a fairly important part of our policy process. Uh, the fact is that um, Aaron only meets twice a year, and uh, sometimes the AC wants feedback in between, and it's good to actually hear from, from the community. You can only poke the mailing list so often. Face-to-face, uh, -face, people tend to generate more ideas. However, if you like that face-to-face -face in involvement, two meetings coming up. Aaron 37 will take place in Jamaica, 17th through the uh, 20th of April, just a few months away. That, and also coming up uh, at the end of the year, uh, joint with Danog, Aaron 38 in Dallas, Texas. These will both be face-to-face -face meetings with full remote participation. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you have the time to travel and can do so, we look forward to seeing you there. If not, we'll see you as remote participants. Thank you for coming. application process. Oh yes, if you know someone who should participate in one of these uh, but needs some financial support to do so, we have a fellowship uh, process. Uh, so we have people who sometimes can't afford to come but with some support could and could help get information about Aaron out to their communities. Uh, that will open up very shortly. Pay attention to that on the mailing list. Thank you all for coming. This ends the PPC at Nanog. <laughs>